I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm welcoming three-time Oscar nominee Steve Morrow, sound mixer of the Netflix biopic Maestro, to our Film Sound Meet the Experts panel. Steve, uh, you can't see Maestro and not see Bradley's imprint on every frame. Yeah. Des describe the experience of collaborating with him on this film, and then and previously on A Star is Born as well. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a Bradley Cooper-directed film is kind of a is a present to everybody who works on it. You know, he really treats the crew as family and collaborators. And he's, he's always, he's always aware of, of everything that's going on. So you, you can, you can really uh, be vulnerable and you can take chances. And I, I think that that's, um, you know, kind of evident in his, his films. Uh, like you said, every frame, every second of the movie is something that he's designed in that way. Um, Star is Born was very similar, you know, same thing, you know, he's just, he has a vision and, you know, if there's somebody that doesn't get it, they're getting pulled along with them anyway. So he's gonna, he's gonna do the film the way he wants to make it. Was, was mixing the sound uh, on Maestro, Steve, appreciably different from A Star is Born? I mean, which you got an Academy Award nomination for, I might add. Right. Uh, they're both music movies, but obviously far different tonally. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the, you know, when you're mixing, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it's it was a completely different uh, beast. You know, we had, it was important to keep authenticity going throughout the, the mix and throughout the movie. And so, you know, you would have these big party scenes uh, you know, or these big arguments in the film. And it was important to Bradley that they felt real. Uh, he had seen a film I did uh, a few years ago called The Front Runner, and that we overlapped every line of dialogue, you know, on camera, off camera, everything. Um, and we were able to pull off something that felt really authentic and real. And he said, you know, let's do that on this film for any of these parties or big scenes with a lot of people. Let's just have them all talk. And on the on the technical level, yeah, you just you put a, a ton of microphones out there and you make sure that everybody is covered and then you allow the, the the scene to play out almost, you know, like a documentary where you're just capturing what you can capture and you can you, you make notes here and there like on the first take, you know, Carrie might have been a, a little bit quieter compared to the party scene. So you you, you know, talk to Bradley and say, hey, can I, you know, can you have her speak up? And he goes, oh, no, you can tell her. <laughs> you know, you just go, okay. Hey, Carrie, do you mind speaking up a little bit? Bradley said, it's okay if I let you know. And she went, yeah, no problem. So, you know, you <laughs> just, you have these moments where you just, you know, he will, you know, if it's your idea, he's not going to, he doesn't jump on it and say, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go tell her. He doesn't mind, you know, the the collaboration between the crew and, the ca and then the cast. You know. Wow. You must have been, we must have been shaking a little bit though doing that. I mean, not really, you know, he's, he does it in such a way that I, you know, you go up to him and say, Hey, Bradley, you know, we should have Carrie speak up. And he goes, yeah, you tell her, <laughs> <I'm> like, oh, <laughs> man, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's a fun, it's a fun set because everybody, you know, like I said, everybody's very familiar with each other. We've made yeah. movies before together and it's, it's, uh, we have a lot of fun, uh, you know, and I, I think there was a time when I went up to Carrie and I said, you know, could you give us a little bit more volume? And she just stared at me. She goes, Mm-hmm. You know, but like as a joke, total <laughs> joke. So um, yeah, I was just going to build on that though, Steve, when you were talking about the conversations and the background party scenes that like, feel natural and people talking over each other as yeah. they sometimes do in real conversation. Did that require a lot of mixing effort to make it sound as real as it does? I mean, I think, I think honestly in, uh, I think the, the real magic of that, I have to throw it to post-production, you know, we on set, for example, the big party scene where it finally goes in the color that we were shooting two different scenes at the same time. We were shooting, you know, Carrie Mulligan's half of the story and we were shooting Bradley's half of the story in the same, at the same time in on the same set. And so that came in the challenge of, you know, what do you want to hear on dailies, you know, cause we, we mixed down to a, just to a, a single mix track for dailies for the editing room. But, you know, you track all the dialogue, you track everything and there'll be moments you know, where, you know, Bradley will say, hey, did you, did we catch that line from Carrie saying this, this, and this? And then you have to go back and you listen to the track and you go, yep, yep, it's there, it's fine. Um, and so the real work, you know, once we've captured all the material, you know, gets handed off the post. And then with the editing room, they decide what they want to hear more or less of. But the, the idea is always 
let's cover it so that they have all the information so that they can make those choices later. Um, because, you know, you can't, it's hard to make a solid choice like that on set. What are you going to hear? What are you not going to hear? So you just try to capture as much as you can and then allow, you know, kind of the magic of post to take it over and, and to really put it, you know, put the audience in the middle of the party. Are there special challenges as a sound mixer working in a movie where music is so prominent? You know, you're telling the story again of Leonard Bernstein. So, I mean, what, it, it, music could not possibly be more front and center. Well, what we what we accomplished on A Star is, is Brad, you know, Bradley wanted to do everything live. And so when his I when that worked out as well as it did, he said, you know, we're going to do uh, Maestro and I want the orchestras and choirs and anything that you see on camera, I want that to be live. I want to hear it. I want to hear it in the space. I want it to feel real. And that's, that's the challenge where you just go, okay, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to capture it in a way that is technically uh, correct, but also, you know, allows the movie to be made because it can't look like a scoring session. You know, <laughs> it just it has to look, has to look real, has to look period. And so those were the challenges, you know, that we thought about for a couple of years and we were able to bring in, um, you know, for the Ely cathedral scene, which was the big, uh, orchestra orchestral scene, we are able to bring in classic sound from London. Who's used to recording the, uh, LSO and they've actually set up in the Ely cathedral before. So we were able to lean on them for a lot of their expertise expertise, but we also kind of dictated here's, here's what we want it to be. Here's, the mic placements, here's the certain things for us as a production, we need it to be this way so that, you know, the, the ultimate goal is to really allow the audience to feel like they're a conductor or feel the music the way a conductor would hear it, because that's not a, that's not something that ever really happens for an audience. You know, you, you go to a symphony, you go, you watch, listen to it on the radio, you don't get to stand in that, in that spot. And that was kind of the goal was to allow the audience to experience the music the way that Lenny must have experienced the music every time. But that's what's so magical about this, Steve. I mean, is you're able to put really audiences in the, literally in the middle of a symphony orchestra. I mean, yeah. as you say, they've never had that before. Usually they listen to classical music on the radio or you know, or whatever the radio equivalent is in the digital age. Uh, right. And it just sounds so rich and immersive. I mean, it's so, so you know, Dolby Atmos yeah. and, uh, um, that's got to be a credit to you and the team. Yeah, I mean, we, we you know, we always strive to do something, you know, it's always the goal to make it interesting uh, on on the technical level, but also, you know, it, it has to be seamless for the audience. If you, if you're, if it's too slick or too different, then you lose the audience. And so it has to be a feeling that you're trying to, portray to the audience that is watching it. So the, you, you want them to get lost in the story, not necessarily in the, the technical aspect. So, you know, there's that fine line of, of playing, you know, being too showy or not showy enough. But I think the way that it was, it was threaded was, you know, in, in a way it just gives the audience this overwhelming emotion when you're watching that scene and you're watching that performance. Um, and so, yeah, on the, on the technical level, you know, you have to plan for that. Uh, I think there was 61 tracks, 61 microphones for that scene. And wow. that's just a lot of information that you're bringing in. And wow. Yeah. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of planning. And that's, then you, you know, that's a few more than I have in my house. <laughs> that's good. Just, just capturing me. Um, yeah. No, uh, uh, Steve, I wanted to ask you just before we wrap uh, as a three time Oscar nominee, um, Tell me about what those experiences, you know, going to the Oscars were like for you, being nominated by your sound peers. I mean, anytime you're nominated, it's um, it's it's a surprise, and it's also you know a feeling of gratitude because you you know you realize there's you know a thousand movies made a year, and you're one of the the five that people feel are at the top of that year's list of, of films, and so I think anytime anytime the nominations happen it's it's always kind of a surprise but it's also such an honor to to have that as something that the rest of the sound community you know thought was one of the the best films sounding of the year uh the loss you know i can't tell you how it feels to, to win maybe mark Ulano can but uh <laughs> but i can tell you 
to to me the the losses don't really matter it's fun to be included it's fun to be part of that um celebration of cinema and just it, it really is the honor of getting nomination because that is from all your peers whereas the the win is from the general overall academy the the nomination really is um it's just it's a i feel grateful when it's when it's happened and um you know i i feel yeah, at the end of the night when you don't walk home with the golden statue it's almost a relief but that's just because i've never won so you know what are you going to do <laughs> at least it feels like a relief <laughs> you don't want to have to give give the acceptance speech yeah oh god no no <laughs> let that somebody else do i'm that. a behind the scenes guy exactly yep yeah well we're going to wrap things there steve morrow good good luck to you uh, thank you sir this coming award season maestro starring uh, bradley cooper and carrie mulligan is playing in limited theatrical release and streams on Netflix beginning December 20th. Thanks for joining us today at Gold Derby. Thank you.